So this is just a review session on July 1st. Oh my God, it is July 1st. I'm recording this as requested. So we're gonna talk a couple things that were brought up. One of the things that we, I just kind of rehashed with everybody and it seems like everyone seems okay with it is the idea of capsular patterns. Seems like everyone's kind of getting that concept even if they don't understand all of the capsular patterns yet. That capsular patterns are something we're gonna test for right? The patient is going to present in a certain manner. You know, for example, with shoulders, they're going to have limited external rotation, limited internal rotation, and limited abduction kind of in that order. So a little bit more external, a little bit less internal, a little bit less abduction, typically those three motions. And when you see those three motions, that indicates that you should mobilize the joint. And again, you're going to mobilize in the direction of the tight capsule and I think I'd mentioned that when I talked to all those PTs and OTs is that basically they said, your pace is pretty much just going to mobilize because, you know, any mobilization, excuse me, at that point is a good mobilization. So then uh, John had specifically asked about myotatic and inverse myotatic. And I think that's a, a good place to start because I think that's one that not only he sent me a message about, but I had two other people send me messages about. So it's not only you, John, so don't worry. I mean, it may be only you, but it's not only you. So I'm just going to bring up a whiteboard here real quick. And man, I've got to get my second monitor set up before class starts. All right. So when we have the, the two reflexes we're going to talk about the, to review are the myotatic. And remember, there's no C in it, so it's just myotatic reflex. chat up so I can see it. Okay, so let me ask a question. And then the in, let's move this just a slight bit. There we go. And then the inverse myotatic. And while it's really kind of important if you're going to get into using PNF on a um, more regular basis to understand the ins and the outs of the myotatic inverse myotatic reflex, because we use those in PNF. For your boards, the important part about it is actually just understanding the reflex itself. So I remember I said that the key for me remembering these going up or yeah, growing up, going up through the program and my thing was understanding that they, the, the number of words in each section kind of indicated what was going on. So myotatic is also known as the stretch reflex. Right. And inverse myotatic is also known as the Golgi tendon reflex. The stretch reflex, I'm just going to draw arrows here because, again, this is the way I always thought of things when I was doing, when I was prepping for the boards, is I did these little kind of diagrams that kind of led me down. I called this the, the path to my solution. The stretch reflex involves the muscle spindles. And the inverse myotatic of the Golgi tendon reflex involves the Golgi tendon organs. So before we go any further, at least does that make sense for everybody? Right. So what I remember about this is, and this is what helped me, was there are two words in that, there are two words in that, there are two words in that, there are three words here, three words here, three words here. That was how I separated them in my brain when I was studying them. Is if the question was asking about myotatic, oh, I knew it was the stretch reflex, oh, I knew it was the muscle spindles. Or if it asked about the stretch reflex, I knew it was the myotatic reflex, and I knew they were talking about the muscle spindles. That was my way of making sense of the chaos because literally these can be really confusing. So that, that being said, what do they do? Well, the stretch reflex kind of makes sense. It's, it's kind of said right in what it does. When a muscle stretches,
the muscle spindle can override that stretch. It's a lot harder to write this mouse than my one at home and cause a contraction. Yes, to over, that's what I was gonna say, to avoid overstretch, right? Specifically, and that's what I was gonna say here is this is specifically an overstretch issue, right? Because if you just do a low and slow stretch, the muscle spindle really doesn't uh, trigger off, right? So this is, you're stretching out the biceps, right? So if we wanna put the biceps on passive insufficiency, we're going to extend the elbow, pronate the forearm, extend the shoulder. So I'm going to come way back here. And let's say that, you know, um, uh, John's stretching me out and John takes my shoulder way past the point where the bicep is so stretched out that it's just kind of pulling. And he's like, okay, come on, we can go a little further. We can go a little further. And all of a sudden, John feels my arm kind of involuntarily contract and go the opposite way he then knows he's triggered my myotatic or my stretch reflex. The idea is there, the muscle says, if you stretch me anymore, you're going to tear the muscle belly and that's not going to be good. And it could also tear off that neuromuscular junction, which is a bigger problem, right? So that stretch reflex is going to keep you from way over stretching the muscle. So, Inversely, it's going to cause the muscle to do everything to put itself back into active insufficiency. So you'll get a full flow through back towards the maximum kind of passive insufficiency motion. I'm going to demonstrate, we use this in PNF. Because I can use this on a technique called quick stretch. And what quick stretch is, is I'll literally take the arm and pop it back into that maximum range of motion. So that when I pop it back there, it'll involuntarily contract and come back. And then I can pop it back there and it'll voluntarily contract and relax. And I can use that to maybe, as you can see, when I just do that naturally, my fist automatically closes. Well, that's that irradiation principle that if I get one muscle to fire, it kind of flows out the hand. It is sensitive. Well, here's the deal. So, uh, Diana, you bring up a good question. We can't do this. We can do this as long as you're trained. Um, I would not say that I would have you do it, right? I, I'm going to demonstrate it so you guys see kind of what it looks like. That, And again, if your PT says, hey, you know, have you seen anyone do the quick stretch reflex? And you say, obviously, oh, Mr. McKeever showed us in class, but let me see the way you do it. And then if you want, if they want to teach you how to do it, it's okay that you learn how to do it as long as you're being directly supervised. And John asked about, and Trey mentioned this, but I'm guessing it's more sensitive with our patients. It typically is, especially in your patients that are spastic, right? Or that are really, really super tight. When they're really, really super tight, it's definitely a little bit more sensitive. Mr. McKeever, with the stretch reflex, would this be like a part of the, like, can we figure out here if the patient has a capsular pattern? Not really, because again, capsular pattern, we're going to measure off a of passive range of motion. Remember, passive range of motion and stretching are two totally different topics. Yeah. Okay. Right. So not typically, I mean, again, with PNF, could we, if I was doing a PNF pattern, could I determine if the patient has capsular pattern? Sure, I could. Right. Especially if I'm experienced in doing PNF and I go, oh, well, I can't get them out here. And then I bring them up and I can't get them to external rotation. I have a pretty good idea they have a capsular pattern, right? And then I may take them out and measure them to see how they're doing. But with the stretch reflex itself, that's not gonna tell us if they're capsular at all. So all the stretch reflex is gonna tell us is, is there a spinal cord reflex in that muscle? So let's say that I'm working with John and John is now 85 years old and he's got foot drop. And the reason he's got foot drop is the, um, the nerve going to tibialis anterior has kind of died off. He's not getting a very good, good reaction from that nerve. 
when he's got when he's lacking that nerve, if I do the stretch reflex on him, nothing is going to happen because the muscle spindles may fire, right? Because the muscle spindles are still there. They're not dead. They're just kind of dormant laying there. But if there's nothing to send that muscle spindle signal back to the spine, nothing's going to happen. So there's going to be no irradiation or no flow back to the spine to trigger that deep tendon reflex to trigger it to come, kind of come back and fire on you, right? But remember, both the muscle spindle, the myofatatic reflex, and the inverse myofatatic are spinal cord mitigated. And when I say spine, and that's a, a term that I think I, somebody else said, well, can you kind of write that out? So spinal cord mitigated. Yeah, no problem, Diana. When I say spinal cord mitigated, what does that mean? Because that's a, that's a big kind of phrase. Like fired up or something? Okay, good, right? It's gonna be fired up. And it also means there's no brain involved. So that means it's a what arc reflex. You guys remember that from anatomy? It goes back and it just goes through the horn cells. It comes back out and fires off a muscle. So it goes out and comes back. That's two different patterns. So it's... The two, the two arc reflex? Two arc reflex, good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, typically. Now, could they, again, and this is where we get into the neuroscience of it, right? Yeah, two neuron arc, exactly, right? Because there's two neurons. There's a neuron sending the sensory back. It gets to the spinal cord. The spinal cord says, I've got to do something, and it sends a motor signal back out. So that's a two neuron arc. Does that make sense? Does that help? Because that was something that I actually got a message about. They're like, I still never understood the two neuron arc to begin with. And what I said to that was, it just it, the wording exactly says what it's doing, right? There are two neurons, a sensory and a motor. And the signal is arcing between them, right? In this case, technically, it doesn't really, it doesn't have to fire off the inner neuron. Now, does the inner neuron have a little bit to play with it? Sure, like again, I said, in the, if you wanna get into the neurophysiology side of it, there's a lot that could theoretically go on with that, Brooke, but we're not going down that path. That's way, you know, that's here, you guys are here, right? And so it's just that kind of that arc that's going around. We fire off something, it sends it back and it sends another muscle contraction, right? So nothing, nothing ever gets up here. Now, do I get sensation up to the brain? Sure, right? If I do that quick stretch, my brain feels that quick stretch still, right? It sends the sensation up to my brain and says, your muscle just got stretched. But the brain isn't what's doing it. It's the spinal cord that's triggering it. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So if you have a two neuron arc or a three neuron arc or a four neuron arc or, you know, whatever X, you know, X neuron arcs, all that's saying is how many neurons are involved in that signal getting to wherever it needs to go. Right. And there's usually, you know, one signal coming to it and then a, maybe one or two signals going out from it. Or it could be two signals coming to it and then one signal going out from it. That's kind of what it says when there's the neuron arc. It's how many nerves are involved. And then how that signal is kind of arcing back and around. It's kind of like a boomerang, right? You can think of that as this is almost like a boomerang effect. I send the boomerang out. It goes all the way up to my spine. Doo -doo -doo -doo, it comes back and fires back. So that's the stretch reflex. Then, yeah, so, so John, yeah, it would be a ballistic stretch. It 100% would be a ballistic stretch. We don't typically classify it as a ballistic stretch per se, because with a ballistic stretch, it's more of a constant bouncing, if that makes sense. With a quick stretch, it's a bouncing back. It's a bouncing back, right? But it is a ballistic stretch, right? Because there is still that bounce going on, right? And um, just like Puff Daddy said, you just got to bounce with me, right? That's kind of what's going on. All right. Never thought Puff Daddy would come into kinesiology, did you? So then we go into the inverse myotatic, the Golgi tendon reflex, or the Golgi, dealing with the Golgi or tendon organs. 
So if the muscle spindle or the myotatic reflex, right, protects you from overstretch, the Golgi tendon reflex protects you from overload. Right. And what I mean by that is this is you, you know, you lift too much. Of a load, right. The GTO detects it's pulling off of its, it's the tendon is starting to kind of strain out at its insertion or its origin. And then what does the what does the GTO cause the muscle to do? Just to give out. Yeah, to give out basically to relax completely, right? The muscle relaxes. Right? So you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm at the gym and I've got, you know, for, yeah, absolutely. So Brooke asked his own inverse myotatic reflex curve when working out and the muscle is starting to fatigue on the last rep. Absolutely. You can get to the point where that kicks in for sure. Right. And sometimes you may hear that at the gym, because what are you going to hear when that's going to kick in? Well, I usually hear like, keep going, but how do you right. know? How do you know when to like actually stop before you injure yourself? Well, here's the deal. If you can't lift anymore, stop. Like if you literally can't lift anymore at the bottom, here's, and this is the nice part for the most part, for the most part, as long as you're not taking supplements to kind of override this, because this reflex here can be affected by guess what type of a uh, supplement that gets taken at the gym by beat heads. Yeah, steroids, right? Specifically testosterone. And that's an anabolic steroid, right? The anabolic steroid can actually override this or at least tamp it down. And when I say tamp it down, it basically makes it harder to fire. Remember we did those uh, action potentials with the muscles firing and stuff like that? Right, Brooke, it's not good. It makes it a higher threshold for it to fire off. And if you get a higher threshold for it to fire off, right, that means you have a greater chance of injury. Yeah. And especially because when you're taking those anabolic steroids, it also kind of tamps down the rest of your nervous system, too, and causes you to kind of ignore what's going on around you, right? We've all seen, yeah, like, if you ever want to see a good example of what steroids does to you, there was a movie in the 1990s called The Program. I highly, 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 highly recommend it. Did anyone ever see that movie? I highly recommend it because in it, there is a guy that takes steroids and goes from one season in college to basically being a monster the next season. And it shows what happens to the human body. And literally, like they did a really good job about that in the movie. Um, it's got some good acting to it. It's got like Omar Epps and a couple other guys that went on to be stars. Um, but it shows what happens to the human body. Like they did a really good job and a lot of research on it, on what happens to meatheads when they take steroids. And I'm using the term meatheads generally. I'm not talking, you could, there are reasons to take testosterone, right? But the people that take it, you know, injecting it for muscle is different. So I go to the gym and I'm at, I'm at the, uh, I'm at Planet Fitness and I'm doing curls, right? And suddenly I put extra weight on and it's beyond my load. Now, two things can happen. One, I can grab a hold of that bar, mentally realize this is too heavy for me. I'm an idiot. I've got to back down the weight. That's what Brooke would do, right? That's exact. Brooke would go, yeah, probably a little too heavy. Let's back down the weight a little bit so I don't injure myself. But let's say I'm not smart. I, I, I cave in. I can lift this. And I pick up that barbell that's maybe 40 to 50 pounds too heavy for me. And I literally start doing my curl. I'm like, I got this. And you got, I got a guy standing beside me. He's like, come on, man. You can do this. You can do this. And Brooke's standing over on the treadmill, just shaking her head going, I'll see him in the clinic. 
and I'm, I'm pulling and I'm pulling, I'm pulling, and you see my muscles start to shake, right? That's a sign that that reflex is starting to kick in, right? Oh, I'm starting to shake, I'm starting to shake. And then all of a sudden, you just see me drop the weight. Literally, like my hands open, my arms open, everything relaxes. That's that irradiation flow, right? What it was is my bicep said, you know, it, there's a phrase that we use in the military, and this is a phrase. I'll let you Google it. I'm not going to explain what that means. FTSIO. And the muscles just give up. And they say, I can't lift this. Well, I don't know what you're doing, but if you make me lift this weight, I am going to get damaged. And so the muscles give up. Once those muscles give out, sorry, I was trying to, I don't know who was calling me there. It was a Tucson number and I had no idea who it was. Once those muscles give out, you're gonna be in that hyper period. Remember that hyper period of the, that, that uh, action potential curve where you're hyper polarized and you couldn't send another signal down the nerve. Do you remember talking about that in anatomy a little bit? A little bit, we talked about it in physics too you enter that kind of refractory period where you're hyperpolarized. And even if you wanted to pick up another weight, your body's going to say, uh-uh, it ain't happening. It is cool how the body protects us, right? Yeah. So that's how those two reflexes work. So the stretch reflex protects us from too much stretch. The Golgi tendon reflex, protect, if we listen right, the Golgi tendon protects us if we have too much load. Now, could I use that in PNF by putting a load on the muscle so much that it relaxes that I could stretch it further? Yeah. Right? So I could be working, say, say Brooke's got a uh, contraction of her bicep, right? Because I picked on John all day. And she's got a contraction of her bicep. I could really put a lot of load on her. So then I tell her, come on, push up against me, Brooke. push up against me, push, push hard, push hard, push hard. And I can keep pushing against her until I feel that muscle fatigue out. And then once that muscle fatigues out, I'd say, okay, relax for me. If it doesn't relax automatically, and then I can stretch her out a little bit. And that's working on that inverse myotatic reflex. So with the myotatic reflex, I can cause a contraction. With the inverse myotatic reflex, I can cause relaxation of the muscle. And that's the cool kind of neurophysiology of PNF to me, at least. I mean, I don't know if you guys think this is cool, but like literally this stuff blew my mind when I was in school. That we could trigger the muscles to do weird things by stressing them a little bit in one way or the other. Would we? Um, I mean, I'm sure, like with with manual, well, not manual, but um, like our own um, when we're when we're stretching them, we can tell like what or how much the muscle can can take, right? Yeah, so like and again, I'm not most of the time. If I'm going to use this inverse myotatic reflex. I'm not going to push them to the point that the muscle actually gives out. I'm going to push until I kind of get that quiver going on because that's kind of the start of that muscle starting to get that uh, the 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 GTR going, the Golgi tendon reflex, inverse myotatic reflex, whatever you want to call it. I know if I I've got you know Brooks kind of shaking a little bit, that bicep's kind of quivering. I know I've got it starting to fire off, and then if I just tell her, okay, relax for me, and she stops contracting, I can stretch her a little further. And is I can there, get a little bit more out of it. Is there a certain amount of time that we would do that or just kind of like real, just watch yeah. the patient? Most, most of the, uh, so most of the books that are, most of the books in the continuing education I've taken on this say, if you have an older adult, so let's just say 50 plus, most of what you're holding is for five to 15 seconds. So somewhere in that range. If you have a athlete, you can hold for about 10 to 30 seconds. If you have somebody that's got muscle build already, if that makes sense, and their muscles aren't likely to tear, right? Because if I got Millie 
and I'm yanking down on her arm like that, there's a good chance I could rip her muscle, right? So I've got to be a little bit more gentle on her. Maybe only do that for five seconds. So I get that quiver and go, okay, Millie, relax. But, you know, I get Oscar in here and Oscar's, you know, all swole and I can torque on him a little bit more. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Does that clear these two up? Yeah, I, th I think probably it's just, it's, it's a complex topic that's, so this, I joke about this. This is a complex topic that's really simple. Once you get it, it's there. Now, I guarantee you in fifth semester, you're going to come back to me and go, I don't remember the myotatic, the inverse myotatic, Mr. McKeever. That's okay, we'll re-go over it. <laughs> but you'll remember some of it. And the nice part is what you'll do is I'll start saying, oh, two, 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 and it'll trigger. Yeah, but the thing is, is this is just one of those that's still kind of a, one of those weird topics that gets a little confusing. So like Diana said about, she because she said about, you know, I, I kind of want to go over PNF. Well, today, what we're going to go over at one o'clock is I'm going to re-go over the patterns, right? I'm going to cover a couple different types of PNF that are not the patterns. So there's different techniques. We're going to talk about those techniques briefly. Yep, we can use my attack in PNF as well. Yeah, we could use either of those in PNF, right? Because I could take, and let's say I do the, that D1 pattern, I'm bringing them up and across, right? And say I'm limited in extension, and that's what I'm weak in, right? You, you can get me to maybe the body, but you can't get me way back here in the you know, 30 degrees of shoulder extension. So you get me coming up and across with that the D1 pattern to feed myself, and you start giving me that resistance. Okay, resist. Come on, come on, Mr. McKeever. Pull, pull, pull. You get that quiver going on. Okay, relax. And then you move me back out into the extension pattern. And then you get that. And we're actually, there's actually specific types of PNF that do either the stretch reflex or the myo inverse myotatic reflex. So, yeah, they, they mix up the two depending upon what you're doing. And so we're gonna cover the different types. I am not expecting you guys to be experts in this. Like I said, we'll talk about it in a second. Let me give you one second, Diane. I'm not expecting you guys to be experts in the types of PNF. What I want you guys to get and what you need to know for your boards when we talk about this today is you just need to know the definitions. That's it. For the clinic, you need to know the patterns. That's it. For the clinics this semester, for you guys going out, doing something in the clinic for this two-weeker, all that the PT or the CI should expect is that you know your patterns, the general directions, and that you could do the passive range of motion of the patterns. You don't necessarily have to be able to do resistive, right? Before you go out on the next clinical, we're actually going to practice more of the resistive PNF so that you're a little bit more prepared for your long-term clinical. And then you can do a little bit more resistive PNF. And then in fifth semester, we're going to tie a little bit of that into some muscle energy technique so that you can kind of combine both the passive with the active resistive type motion and get more out of the PNF. So it kind of builds over the next three semesters until I kick you out and I never want to see you again. I mean, till I love you guys. Are we okay on those at least? Then I can answer kind of Diana's question. We okay on myotatic inverse myotatic? That's good. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm gonna stop the whiteboard for a second just so I can talk because it's better if you can see my whole red face here. I gotta figure out I gotta adjust the color on this camera bad. All right. So Diana asked, is lumbar grip the index fingers, middle fingers? Lumbar grip is the whole hand. So your lumbar goals are all in this kind of portion of your hand, right? They're intrinsic muscles. They make you form that tabletop, right? And that's the pattern that you're going to use when you're holding onto the patient's hands because that allows, if I have that grip, I can slide easily up and down the arm and still control it. If I have a death grip on the arm, it's really hard for me to slide without giving somebody a burn up the arm. And remember that lumbar grip is part of what technique that we learned when we were talking about nerve glides. Do you remember what that's part of? Do you remember? Six pack. The six pack, yeah, right? It's part of the six pack, right? We're here, 
right here, 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 open, 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 opposition. Do you remember us doing that? That lumbrical grip is part of the six pack because when I'm in lumbrical grip, all of these extensor tendons are kind of stretched out. So, and that may be something some of you have trouble with. Maybe when we're working on PNF, you're having trouble getting in the lumbrical grip. A lot of times what it is is your extensors are really tight. And you may have to kind of stretch out those extensors a little bit. And I just popped three of my knuckles doing that. So you may have to stretch those extensors out a little bit so that you can get it. Even me, you can see I've got a, a pseudo boutonnieres contraction on my pinky. So lumbrical, lumbrical is the duck grip. That's the way I remember it. Does that help, Diana? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. All right. Is there anything else that you can think of to review right now? And obviously my headache's a little bit better, so I appreciate you guys sending me well wishes. Um, evidently your prayers work. No, the prayers didn't work. Just taking some meds worked. Um, but who knows? Maybe prayers work. I can't discount them. I don't want to get you guys mad at me. Um, so I kind of wanted for you to explain this a little bit more because yeah. for some reason yesterday I couldn't find the link to our cohort um, lecture. So I did the ones from last semester. Yep. Um, so I didn't probably I missed it on our lecture. Yeah, but, I just, I just so posted have... a little bit later last night. That's probably why you couldn't find it. Oh, OK, OK. That's it is posted um, now. OK, perfect. So we you have approximation, which is stability, which is yep. close packed, right? Yep. And then traction, which is mobility, which is open packed. Yep. So when you're talking about like approximation, like obviously I know that's like um like you gave an example as like when you're bending down, your stomach is the approximation, like soft tissue approximation. That's soft tissue approximation. It's not bony approximation, but soft tissue, yeah. Okay, so I'm not understanding like well, approximation when we're talking about PNF. Sure. Well, so for PNF, let's say that I've got a patient that's got a really sore shoulder. And I'm, I, I look at the PTE valve and the PTE valve says the patient suffers from subluxations. Right. So subluxations means my shoulder kind of dips a little bit out of socket. Right. It's not completely out, but it kind of that gleno that it drops a little bit in the glenoid fossa. Right. So it's not completely up in there where it is. Correct. If I have somebody that has that, what I can do when I'm doing PNF patterns or when I'm just doing range of motion, it doesn't even necessarily have to do all with PNF. It can also do with just doing range of motion. Could be with stretching, could be with exercises. What I can do is I can give him a little bit of support and kind of push that shoulder, the, the humeral head a little bit into his socket. So when he's doing his PNFs, it feels like his shoulder is more stable. Another example of that was, let's say I have some neck pain. So we know that distraction works really good for separating out those discs, right? But sometimes if the neck pain is due to instability in the neck, where maybe I'm just hypermobile, what you can do is you can come and put a little bit of pressure up here on my head and push down and provide a little bit of approximation of those spinal discs. And the patient will be like, oh my God, that feels so much better. Because what you're doing is kind of, given a little bit of pressure on the spinal disc and you're now stabilizing the neck so it doesn't slide all over the place. And you may do that so that the patient can do some other exercises, right? Maybe what we're working on is Y's and T's with the patient. And every time the patient's doing that, you're noticing that maybe some, you, he's like, man, it feels like my vertebrae and my spine are shifting way out of place. So I'll put a little bit of pressure on his head and say, okay, now do your Y's now. And the patient's like, oh, my God, that feels so much better. Well, then we know that they've got instability in that neck, right? And what are we going to have to do to those neck muscles then? If they're, in, if they're not, if they're not, like, if they don't have stability, then you would um, use something to push them together, like compress them? You compress them a little bit. And then also to get the muscles, the whole, yeah, we're going to strengthen them, right, Stephanie? We're going to strengthen those muscles so they do the natural compression. Right. And that can happen to some people. I mean, especially like pregnant women are a big, com a big common one that I've dealt with before, where because you had that relaxing hormone going through your body, ladies, um, it causes all of your ligaments and all of your joints to become kind of loosey goosey. 
And so I've had patients that they'll say, you know, when I'm laying down on my side, my neck really gets kind of sore. And, and I say, well, how does your pillow look? And they're one of those people that sleep on a pillow like this. Right now, if I put a different pillow there, I'm actually technically approximating that neck. I'm stabilizing the neck. I'm bringing those bones closer back together, right? So that I can relieve some pain. A lot of times positions of stabilization relieve pain, right? Whereas positions of mobilization, right? Or the open packed slash distracted position increase our overall mobility. Right. It'll, it'll allow us to move a little bit better. So that's there's a delicate balance there that the PT has to determine. Do we want to focus more on that stability? Right. Are we is our problem stability? Is it mobility or is it a combination of both? Right. So maybe at the shoulder, my problem is mobility. I'm having problems moving that shoulder. But at the neck, my problem is stability. Right, so I may have to work more on mo moving and stretching out the shoulder while strengthening and stabilizing the neck. Does that make sense, Diana? It does. Now that you explained it, I feel kind of, you know, a little dumb. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do not feel dumb. These are, so these, again, these, you're in third semester. You're starting to get into the higher level thinking type stuff. Yeah, so basically you would do like some type of stretches or like modalities when it comes to approximation and traction. Yeah. Yeah, okay. or, right. or just techniques as well. I could do stretching as well, right? Okay. Yeah, I could do, so I could theoretically do, like if I was worried about, say I had stability in the neck, I could do NMES on the neck along with doing a little bit of stability work so that the muscles are firing and kind of tightening up while I'm keeping him nice and stable and saying, okay, hold your head exactly like this, good. I'm going to keep your hold there. Now let those muscles fire. Okay, good, right? And what I'm doing is I'm teaching him proper posture as well as doing the strengthening techniques. Right? And then we would go based on like what the PT recommends, like if we're working on um, stability or mobility yeah. at that point. Okay. And then you may get some PTs where they're like, I'm not sure which it is, right? They're like, it could be a stability, could be a mobility. So a lot of times they're gonna just throw a couple of different things in there of both techniques. And that's where we go back to them in our notes and say, hey, this worked really well this didn't work at all, right? And that's the communication we have as a PT, PTA. We're gonna watch and you'll get better at this. this is not something that you're gonna be an expert at right now. Please don't think that, right? For you guys right now, if we're going on in the two-week clinical, you guys just have to follow a flow sheet and be able to do it. That's pretty much it. You don't have to be experts at figuring out if the stability working, is mobility working? What you guys have to understand is if I'm doing mobility, why I'm doing it? Well, I'm doing it to increase the ability for a patient to move and get around, right? Stability is providing me with that nice, core, stable base so that when I get to mobility in that point, I've got a good base to build from, right? I can't do balance work. Like for those of you that have ever done dance, that's fine, John. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna end the meeting once we're done, just to start the recording of this, and I'll restart the meeting for the class. So if you if you pop out, it's okay. Just pop back in then. For dance or martial arts, a lot of our techniques at the very beginning of either of those are very basic, grounded techniques. Right, both feet on the floor, usually both feet nice and flat. You're building stability in your techniques, and then as you get better right? And ballet and dance in the martial arts, we start adding stuff where we're doing spinning techniques, where we're doing multiple directional techniques, right? Where we're incorporating the arms and the legs. And then in the martial arts, we incorporate stuff like jumping spinning techniques, right? And ballet, I think ballet, I think they do the same thing, maybe in dance. I don't know enough about dance and ballet to say that, but that's kind of the process, right? You've got to build that stable core before we can get very mobile. Make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Anything else anyone can think of that they want to cover before class starts? I have one more question, but if you want to like hop off, we could. No, it's fine. Go ahead and ask it. Okay, so one of the goals for PNF is um, for postural responses, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just like I, I'm trying to think like how do you work on postural responses like i'm not i'm really understanding that yeah either. so what i what i briefly covered and i again this was a we're going to talk about this when we talk about rhythmic stabilization and 
I'm drawing a blank on the other one right now. There's another alternating isometric. So there's two different techniques called rhythmic stabilization, alternating isometric. So we're going to talk about today that are going to work on postural training. But the other thing is, let's say that I'm doing PNF, right? If I do single-sided PNF, I'm getting trunk rotation. You see how I'm doing that? When I'm, do I'm getting a little bit of trunk rotation when I do this. So I'm working some postural technique just by doing that. If I add two in, right? Now I'm kind of here, extending back. Here, extending back. Or here, extending back, right? Oh, yes. Now is, does it click? Yeah, it, it does. Yeah. Good. So like, it's, I mean, like, I'm just thinking it'll be a little hard, like if you're working with patients that, and I don't want to ask this because I know you're saying like, once we get to the semesters, we're going to go more in depth, but I was just thinking how, how hard would it be when you're working with a patient that has like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, like that's going to be pretty hard. I feel. Yeah. Like. <laughs> we're not going to do a lot of PNF with those patients. I mean, I may oh, do, you some, won't. Okay. yeah, I may do some PNF. Uh, so rhythmic initiation, that passive PNF I may do with them. Right. But yeah, if I've got somebody that's really kind of confused and agitated, some of these advanced PNFs are a no go. Right. These are going to be more for your patients that you're seeing kind of an outpatient basis or even like maybe an acute care that's under 75 or something like that or under 65 even that the patient is cognitively there. It's going to be and hard. Than not. And we could do this for like pediatrics as well. Sure. Yeah, I do it all. I do like. It's amazing how much the kids love PNF because it's not the same type stuff, right? And I can get creative, right? And I'll have kids like chase the butterfly going up and down, right? And I'll make games out of it. Um, I had, uh, in the one clinic we had, we had zippers on the wall where they would do zipper patterns and the zippers were PNFs. And so they would zip the zipper, unzip the zipper, zip the zipper, unzip the zipper. And said so all kinds of techniques to add to that. So we can get real creative and you can work PNF and you can do PNF without the patient even really knowing what you're doing. Hey, I, you don't have to tell them you're doing PNF because they're going to be like proprioceptive. What? Yeah, tricks then. Tricksy little hobbits. Stephanie, you okay overall? Just checking. You've been quiet. Just listening, Diana, usually. Okay. I just want to make sure you're okay. That's all. Thank you. You know me, I'll ask if I have- I know, I still like chicken. Same thing with Brooke. I just check in with her every now and then when she's been a little too quiet. Okay, thank you. So do not be, do not be sorry, Diana, because if, again, I'm going to say this. If you have questions, somebody else here has the same questions. Anthony, that's because I know you'll email me if you have a problem. I don't have to check on you too much. I just pick on you. Anthony's too, too cool to ask questions in school. He's got to ask them privately. All right, so are we good overall? My God, I have one more question, Mr. McKeever. Okay. <laughs> you guys could be. <laughs> okay, so um, I know that in the entire concept of PNF is ir irradiation, mm -hmm. but can you give me more of an example of that? Yeah, so irradiation is when I use one muscle to fire another muscle. So that concept is basically like, let's say that I have a stroke and my hand isn't working. And this is where, and this is what I was going to talk a little bit about today. This is how I realized PNF works. I had a patient that their hand was flaccid. So it's just their forearm and down was flaccid. Their bicep worked, their tricep worked, their shoulder worked fine. It was a weird stroke. And so I said to my PT, I said, hey, can I try this PNF that Dr. Borromeo taught us in school? And he's like, dude, I don't care what you try. Go for it. And so I started doing it. And what I found was when I got him to contract his bicep and bring his hand up and across his body, his hand closed. And I was like, the first time that happened, I was like, holy crap, it works. And then when I had him extend his triceps out, I found out that his hand would open. So what that is, is the biceps, so I'm firing off my shoulder flexors, I'm firing off my adductors, I'm firing off my internal rotators, right? Firing off my biceps, my brachialis, my brachioradialis, all that. That brachioradialis, think about it, goes all the way out here to my wrist, right? 
it sends a signal all the way out here. And for whatever reason, that nerve signal then travels out to my hand and causes my hand to close. That's the concept of irradiation. It can work in reverse too. Let's say my shoulder is my problem, but my hand is okay. I can start with opening my hand up and making it a very wide hand, going back, firing off all the muscles in the back of my arm for my extension, firing off my triceps, my forearm, firing off my triceps on the back of my humerus, and then it fires my shoulder. It's really wild the way that works. And Brooke asked, do we do that naturally when we have an injury? We technically do, right? But we just didn't integrate that into therapy. Yeah, right? We just didn't integrate that into therapy. We do that. We naturally kind of, if we're injured in one area, we compensate with other muscles. But we don't, what we don't think about is how we can use those other muscles to actually get the muscles that are damaged to work. And that's the concept of your radiation. That makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know like examples like of like the of the muscles. That wasn't like I, I mean I understand that you're using yeah. other muscles to to fire, but I wasn't sure like but the 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 examples you gave of the triceps and biceps yeah. that I helped a lot. So I mean I can even take it a step further. Remember when we were talking about those postural awareness, right? Let's say I have a patient that's maybe a T, let's go T11 spinal cord injury. And so they've got kind of muscles down to the belly button, right? Or a little bit of belly button and above. I can actually bring those, those muscles down and by doing those patterns like this, where it causes me to come into flexion, it can even irradiate down and fire my lower rectus abdominis and get a nice tight core. And then the same thing, when I go back, it's gonna spread down my erector spinae and get me to make a big wide open kind of arc with extension. So it's kind of cool the way it works. And again, once it truly works, it's it. And again, does it work for everybody? No, absolutely not. It doesn't work for everybody. And it's not going to be for every case. But this is just another tool that you put in your toolbox going, I can't figure out what to do with this patient. Let's try this. Like, that's what I did with my stroke patient. Nothing was working. We we're doing basic range of motion. We we're doing exercises. Nothing was working. I'm like, let's just try PNF. And literally at his face, when his hand closed, he like looked at his hand and he's like, did that just happen? And I'm like, maybe let's go the other way. And so we went the other way and sure enough, his hand opened. And so we started integrating that into his techniques. When he was grabbing for his cups, I would have him make big sweeping motions to get his hand to close around the cup. Yeah, his hand was oh, I, flaccid. It just wasn't moving, right? It was kind of flaccid initially, right? It was definitely kind of loosey-goosey. Um, it wasn't complete nerve denervation. It was just that the signals weren't getting there from the brain because he had that stroke. So the nerves were intact, right? Now, if you're somebody like, let's say you're like me when I first injured my neck where that nerve was cut off up here. You can do PNF till the cows come home and I'm not going to move my arm, right? If the nerve signals aren't going, game over, right? Now, again, that's why I said with spinal cords, that's what gets weird. And we're going to talk all kinds of fun stuff about that next semester. The preview. Salve bien? Everyone okay? Yeah, that was all my questions. Thank you, Mr. No McKeever. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the meeting here just so that I can start this recording saving. And then I'll reopen my room again. I'm going to get up and grab a quick snack and we'll start up at one o'clock. How's that sound? Thank you. All right. I'll see you guys at one.